Germans. In the interests of fairness, I decided it would be best to kick off by asking a group of 20-something Berliners what they think of the British. Are you sitting on your stupid aisle saying, well, we, we alone, <laughs> leave us, the rest is just a continent, we don't have anything to do with Europe. And um, well, if I look at your health system, for instance, it's pure shit, there's nothing. Nothing is going on there. You know, what's really funny about the UK is that you only have these separate water taps. You can never wash your hair. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not with you on this. The, the taps in England are wrong. So we have a hot tap and a cold tap. Yeah, but That's they're right. not together. You, you can't mix, no you mix, can't, you can't mix the water. No, this is the big thing that's wrong with England. You have to mix the water in this. Uh, exactly. Englishmen, are, do they piss uh, standing or sitting? Standing. Standing? Yeah. Sure. And what about a carpet and a toilet? Well, we I aim, mean, it's, you know, we aim for crying out loud. What do you do? Just I mean, spray it around? You try to aim. <laughs> Think what you're saying, man. Just aim it in the water. Well, there we are. I was fair, I gave them their turn, and all they could come up with was our taps. Well, now, it's my go. Germany has only existed as a country for just over a hundred years. But in that time, the people here have stood on the brink of starvation, they've been bankrupt, they've had two military coups, they've killed six million Jews, they've started two world wars, they've been occupied by four foreign powers, and they've invaded nearly all of their neighbours. Small wonder, then, that the Germans have had very little time to learn how to play musical instruments. Doesn't matter which radio station you turn to, it's always complete rubbish. If you gave my six-year-old daughter a violin, she would make a more appealing noise than this. But of course, there's so much more to Germany than a dodgy past and bad music. There's the German fondness for the mullet and the German obsession with making sure that everything runs on time. When the Berlin Wall came down, they said they'd have East Germany up to Western standards in precisely seven years. Unfortunately, the master race has failed. They completely underestimated the scale of the problem. Everything had to be replaced. Sewers, power supply, phones, roads, the lot. Even today, East Germany is still one giant building site. You come out of your hotel in the morning, and the road outside is gone. The cost of all this building work is absolutely astronomical. Last summer, not surprisingly, the shiny new city of Berlin went bankrupt. Again. And there's some way to go. Most of the back roads are still cobbled. You spend all your time on a motorway in a contraflow. And when you pull into a service station, the shop is still full of stuff you don't want to buy. Still, I did get a CD, so I didn't have to listen to that umpar nonsense on the radio anymore. Come to arrest me for wearing a horrible hat. Certainly, the East German traffic police don't have to worry about the locals breaking the speed limit. Because, of course, this is still Trebat Central. They've come to Zwickau, which is the town where Trebants were made, because I've heard that there's a bit of a gathering of them going on today. I'm not, however, going to turn up in the E-type. That would be 
showing off. And anyway, I found something much more appropriate. Yep, it's a stretch trabant, which will make me the star of the show. Hello, fellow travelling people. Loads of them. Sadly, though, my arrival was a bit of a damp squib. Damn it. Look at this. I've been completely outstretched. It is a trabant. A staggering 6,000 trabants set off to come to this event, some coming from as far away as 40 miles. But only 2,000 made it. This one made it here, but then the owner turned his stereo up too loud. And now look what's happened. Would you like to come and live in my Ito? This is like any other car show I've ever been to. The mullets may have been a little thicker on the ground, but there was the same fascination with flames and noise. But why the Trabant? As a means of transportation, it's worse than a pogo stick. As an art form, it's up there with a wheelbarrow. So why not simply part exchange it for a flower pot and buy a car? Well, I suspect something strange is going on here. For 10 years, there was a drive to unify Germany, to erase all memories of what had happened in the East. But now you sense that some people are trying to preserve some of those old communist icons. We see that here with all the old Trabants. And look at this stall I've found. It's selling East German military memorabilia. Yeah. Chemical warfare. And these, oh, I need, I need some shoes because it's very muddy. Oh, chat boots, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you mind if we just turn the camera off while we just adjust the belt? Moment. <laughs> Does he have an order of Lenin medal? He must have heard of Lenin. Lenin. Lenin, the Russian, the bait that caused you all. How could you not have heard of Lenin if you lived in East Germany? How can this be? How do you say Lenin? Not John Lennon! John Lennon! I know what you mean. Lenin, little beard, bald, Russian revolutionary. Oh, Lenin! 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 This movement to preserve memories of the East, or Ost as they say in German, has a name. It's called Ostalgia, and it's everywhere. The hotel I stayed at, for instance, employed an actor. He was dressed up as a not terribly convincing guard. The building itself, however, was authentic in every way. To give a taste of what life was like in the old days, you have to fill in 500 pointless forms, and then 500 more. The staff were as East German as a tractor. Yes, yes I am. I am married. Lady. I wasn't planning on any. And even before I'd finished changing 20 marks into a foot-high pile of useless commie cash, I was bored. But it was good practice for a night in my bedroom. Thank you. There was nothing to do but think. And what I thought was this. Why? 
Why would you want to restore a communist hotel? Visiting businessmen can imagine what life was like here, and they do imagine it down the road at the Holiday Inn. Which is probably why, shortly after my visit here, this hotel went bust. Oh, now this should keep me going. Look at this. Look at this, everyone. It's, it's a report from the Politburo to the Central Committee of the SED, which is the Communist Party, and it's got a foreword by Eric Honecker. Eventually, when I'd done everything you can do in an East German hotel room, I went to the bar. Brown coal. The worth of brown coal is getting greater. East Germany has the lowest birth rate in the world. And now I know why. There's no one to sleep with. And there's no point going into town because there's no one there either. Look at this. A fully restored East German town at 8.30 on a Saturday night. It is totally deserted. So where is everyone? Well, this is an old East German salt mine, a place that used to employ 3,000 people. But then along came capitalism, which closed it down and turned it into a racetrack for bicycles. And it's not just cycle racing either. Today there are plans to turn this place into a sort of vast underground nostalgic Disney World. Salt and Towers. I joined a guided tour to find out more. How big? How long? 20 kilometers. 20 kilometers from one end of the mine to the other. So huge that they use the equipment to make underground boating lakes, concert halls, restaurants. So after a dull night in a dull hotel reading dull books, dull nostalgia tourists will be invited down here to make merry in the old network of tubes. Oh, oh, oh. Holy shit! <laughs> the driver's just got in a big hole! Yeah. Okay. Have a nice okay. trip. Come, sir. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Shit. Shit. Very nice. But what about the thousands and thousands of people who used to work here? Well, they did what I'm doing now. They moved from East Germany to the richest, most powerful place in all of Europe. The epicenter of all that's good and right and proper when it comes to taps. West Germany. So, is life better for them over here? Well, not if they like a drink, it isn't. Some of the vineyards here on the banks of the Rhine are the oldest in the world, with roots going back to 700 AD. And yet, amazingly, even though they've had 1,300 years of practice, they still can't get it right. The original Blue Nun, so named because she wore a blue habit, lived in Spain in the 17th century. She was accused of being a heretic after she claimed that she was making nocturnal visits to South America every night and converting remote tribesmen to Christianity. That's 
Not very interesting. What is interesting is that when they exhumed and examined her body 350 years after her death, they found that it hadn't decomposed at all. So, the Blue Nun was a chemical freak. Cheers. The Muller Thurgau grape from which Blue Nun is made is not a particularly sweet variety. Here we go, we've got some here, look. It's a harmless looking little thing, isn't it? But one day that's going to wind up on a table in Rotherham where it will decimate an entire hen night. Now, of course, I know that Germans do make good wine. So why do they continue to make the bad stuff? Well, to find out, I went in search of a local wine expert. Most people even don't know Blue Nun, so you can't buy it. You can't buy it here? No. You never will find Blue Nun in the, in, in the shop or in a restaurant, so the people don't know it. You can't buy Blue Nun anywhere in Germany? No. Um Maybe a few shops. Black shop. Tower? No. Near Steiner Gutes Domtal? Yes, and some very cheap get... supermarkets. Yes. But Blue Nun and Black Tower are not available in no. Germany. No. That's astonishing. I never saw it in Germany in a shop. So you're just sending it to us? Yes. You send your That's rubbish right. to us? That's right. What, stop it. <laughs> so what then would Germans think of this Did stuff? Do you speak English? It's white wine. Yes, no. Perhaps, like, really cold would be good. Colder than this would be I good. think the temperature is the least of its problems, actually. Yes, it's white wine. Good? <laughs> no. No. Not nice? No. Would you exchange two tins of your Holston pills for one bottle of Blue Nun? It would be very nice with chicken with an apricot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. It's super. good? Good, super. Have more. The German wines are usually sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> How could you get it sweeter than that? <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Yeah? More? It's fine, eh? Unbelievable. I thought they'd think Blue Nun was funny. But I was forgetting, of course. This is Germany. Nothing is funny. Look at it this way. If a businessman went to an English park at lunchtime and took all his clothes off, passers-by would laugh so much they'd burst. So what happens here? No? It doesn't matter. And it's not funny? Not really. OK. Is that lustig? Obviously not. Is that lustig? No. No? Is he funny? No. Not no? Really. Not funny? No, because of the socks. It's, it's not the interesting. Socks. <laughs> Dish? No. Yeah, it is, it is yeah, lustig. For me it's lustig. Oh, good. Despite the lack of obvious customers, there are now a handful of comedy clubs in Germany. Jeremy Clarkson, bitte schön! I went to one of them in an amusing jacket to carpet bomb the audience with a selection of world renowned, tried and tested British humour. My mother in law is so gross, sir. Ein Horse. Uh, again into Iron I pub. used the lot. Horses in pubs, Welsh mothers in law, fat Welsh mothers in law in pubs with horses, but I failed to raise even so much as a titter. Your enormous good nut. Nothing makes this lot laugh. I have noticed it going around Europe. You tend to find, if you go into a French bar, restaurant, people are eating. If you go into an Italian bar, people are arguing. If you go into a Spanish bar, people are asleep. A British bar, you hear the sound of laughter, and here it's the sound of talking. I mean, if we just stop now, there's no laughter. But still, there might be talking. I mean, I'm looking around. I don't see a smile in the entire bar. 
A recent report said that the British laugh for 15 minutes a day, whereas the Germans manage only six. Naturally, for the Germans, this deficiency is no laughing matter. So now, at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings, you must report to the Humour Church for some organised laughing. The evening kicked off with some ho-ho ha-ha-has and then got worse. Naturally, this being Germany, there was someone in charge telling us what sort of laughing to do. So we fired laughter machine guns. We threw laughter tomatoes. Followed by some more ho ho ha ha ha's. Why don't they just go to the pub? Ho ho ha ha. Then we grew laughter trees became laughter monsters and inevitably I was wondering when we got back to this this shirt pleats in his trousers this is a truly extraordinary place some people may have accidentally worn funny clothes, but at no time did anyone deliberately say or do anything remotely amusing. However, my evening here did dispel a popular myth. The Germans do laugh. You just have to tell them what time and where. Right. We've established so far that Germans wee on the floor and that they export blue nun to us because they think it's nice. But now I've come to Cologne, a city notable mostly for its dirty cathedral, to raise perhaps the most difficult and embarrassing question of them all. Why do you always have to nick all the daybeds in holiday resorts? For a, a proper German, holiday is as hard work as um, being on the factory, and you have to organize it. You have to get up early. You have to, to um, put all. Um, you have to take away the towels from the British of the British um, holiday spenders and put the own, the bigger towels there. Then you have to better uh, made towels as well, I presume. Yeah, of course, yeah, German yeah. handwork. And for them, it's hard work, and they come um, back from their holidays totally exhausted, and uh, and then they um, recover on their work. Germans even work hard in the evenings. Most belong to at least a handful of clubs. Why? For Germany, it's very necessary to, to be a member at, uh, in at least, let's say, four or ten clubs or so, because um, free time is something very dangerous. You don't know what you, what you have to do, and nobody tells you where to go and what to do. A German is used to do what he is told to. If he is told, um, be nice and gentle to everybody, he will do it. Um, he doesn't believe in what he is doing, but he does it. And um, if he's told, um, run over Poland and build concentration camps, um, he will do it as well. So if I say, drink that wine, Yes, sir. <laughs> you will do as you think. You will. You'll just do as he's told. It's fantastic. Life in Germany is regimented and controlled to a point you simply wouldn't believe. If it's a Sunday, for example, I'd be breaking the law by washing the car. And again, by mowing the lawn. And again, by hanging the washing out to dry. You are, I'm glad to say, allowed to feed the cat. Come on, Goring. But not in your garden. Goring. Then, if I'm driving along and a sausage dog trots into the road, should I stop? No! A German court recently decided that a sausage dog is too small to warrant an emergency stop. And that drivers must keep going. And then there's golf. Vier! Which I think is German for four. Surely this must be all right. Um, no. 
It turns out that before you can play golf in Germany, you must get a license, not from the club, but from the government. They cost £700, and before you get one, you have to sit a written exam. Of course, a lot of Germans get round the problem of the licence by simply reverting to type. They clear off every weekend and play in Poland. Do you think that the worst thing that has ever happened in European history was the formation of Germany? I would say for Germany it was the best thing ever happened. Um, but for the rest of Europe, I mean, we've had really a hundred years I mean, of if hell. Germany wouldn't have been founded in 1870, you would have nothing to talk about in Europe. And uh, we um, won a war um, against... Yeah, we won a war. Oh yes, there was one. It was in 1870 against our arch enemy, the French. We won it and we um, founded the German nation in, in France. But um, after that we started some other wars. We lost them mostly. So now we are heading for the EU because this is more people which you can rule and command. And so we are um, very eager on, on having something like a, um, yeah, the United State of Germany. Why am I laughing? Why am I laughing at the prospect? You're going to do it again, aren't you? So, now we've learned that in addition to the music, the wine, the haircuts, the complete lack of humour, the catastrophic history and the desperate problems in the East, that Germany is still a dictatorship. So, apart from nice taps, what do they have here that's good? Well, there is this place. It's the biggest. Longest, most fearsome racetrack in the world. The Nürburgring. Located high in the Eiffel Mountains, it just goes on and on for 13 miles, round 187 corners. It's so vast that entire villages nestle in its midst. And it's so dangerous that over the years, it has taken 200 lives. They used to hold Grand Prix racing here until 1976, when Nicky Lauda lost control of his Ferrari at a corner called Bergwerk. And in the ensuing fireball, he lost most of his ears. Top flight motorsport was banned here, but the track was never closed. Instead, it was opened up to the public, and so now, every weekend, people come with their cars, their bikes and their mullets to take it on. You simply hand over seven pounds and they'll let you do a lap. Balls out, no limits. But if you don't want to risk it in your own car, there is an alternative. Taxi! Yeah, we'll go around, uh, around the circuit, please. Ah. Forwards. Well I'd like you to meet Sabine Smits, who is without doubt the fastest taxi driver in the entire world. Sure, I am. You are? <laughs> I hope so. How old were you when you got the lap record round right here? 19. 19 years old and you got the lap record. So what car was that? It was a Ford Sierra Cosworth. And you were 19 years old? Yes. <laughs> How fast was it? Eight minutes, 16 seconds, which we do in a taxi. This, this will do in eight minutes, 16? Yes. How old were you when you first went round here? Oh, around about six months. My, oh. fa <laughs> <laughs> My father took me around here. I was screaming on the back seat. Wow! So how old were you when you thought, that's fantastic, you know, I really want to do this? 
17. 17. I even had no driver license. And I did a lap and I did quite well. And then we get involved into motor racing. So if you're in the same car, you'd be faster than anyone around here, really? Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I try to be faster than anybody. So is there a bit of a game here to see if anyone can go around faster than you? Yeah. Really? It looks like that. Yeah. So people queue up to say, wait for Sabine to come round? Yes. <laughs> but after a few corners, they are gone in the mirror, I don't know. You presumably know what comes. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep your on the road, that's a good girl. Yeah, don't worry. There's no point trying to take Sabine on because she'll thrash you. And actually, there's no point to the Nürburgring either because in Germany, you can go flat out on the autobahns. These astonishing feats of engineering were the world's first motorways and even today there are no speed limits. And no danger, of course, because German cars are perfect. They're not allowed to go wrong. Unfortunately, however, my car was not German. And nor were its tires. Two issues to having a blowout at 100 miles an hour on the German Autobahn. First of all, I was acutely aware of having no seat belt and no rollover bar. But more important than that, if we look in the boot, where the spare wheel is supposed to live, we find all our camera equipment. It was soon repaired by a perfect German technician using perfect German tyres and I was back on the perfect German roads on my way to see another perfect piece of perfect German engineering. In the first 32 years of the last century, the Germans won 31 Nobel Prizes for their engineering. Well, they weren't going to win any for peace, were they? To understand just how good they are, I've come to see this, the biggest glider in the world. It has longer wings than a Boeing 727, and it's fast too, 180 miles an hour. I'd never been gliding before, so I asked the owner if he could take me for a spin, and he said yes. Unfortunately, with a parachute on, I didn't really fit. Without a parachute, all was well. But then a German law sprang out of nowhere. But do you have to have a parachute? You have to have a parachute, yes. This is a German, German it's, law? This is German law, yeah. So it doesn't look like I can go? Uh, it looks like, yeah. Okay. Well, it, that's 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 Still, my day wasn't completely wasted. It turned out I was the only person there who was tall enough to wipe away the raindrops from the top of the rear wings. I was sad though because this really was a truly beautiful machine. You just can't believe how light it is. I mean, one finger. The Germans have completely dominated the sport of gliding for 80 years. So why is that? After the First World War, you remember we lost even the First World War too. And uh, we were forbidden to fly uh, any aeroplanes. But then people uh, flew gliders. So you weren't allowed to have an aeroplane in Germany after the First no, World no, War? No, 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 of course not. And because we were the bloody dangerous, <laughs> as you all know. Never know what you want. <laughs> and and then, then this was a good thing, because we just have to go back to gliding, to flying, like the birds fly. Hans is the best glider pilot in the world. He has 48 world records. But then he did learn to fly in the most difficult arena of them all. In the Nazi time, gliding was very popular. What we did not know at that time was that it was a preparation for having uh, people go as pilots to the Luftwaffe. I volunteered for the Air Force and I became a uh, K-1 
career officer, as you call it, and I enjoyed it quite a bit until you bastards started shooting at us. <laughs> yeah. And you're how old? Uh, 78. 78? Yes. Uh, wow. But I must admit, sometimes I feel like 76. <laughs> <laughs> So, he's the oldest glider pilot in the world, flying the biggest glider in the world. And that's the thing about the Germans, isn't it? They have to be the biggest. They have to be the best. Perhaps that's why we're all so frightened of them. There is a nervousness among other European countries that the Germans want to dominate Europe. Yeah, you don't think so? It's, 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 I think it's the opposite. Yeah. What did you go? Of all our neighbors, I have to say, they are always afraid and feel inferior. So that's their point. It's their problem. It's not our problem. What that we feel nervous? Inferior. Yes. All. Are we inferior? Obviously, if you feel like that. <laughs> well, yes. Our taps may be wonky, but at least we are allowed to feed our cats in the garden. Our sausage dogs are safer. We have more freedom, better haircuts, prettier cars, more of a laugh, a more distinguished history, and yes, even nicer wine. And we're better at music, better at football, 5-1, and thank God, better at fighting. If you watch a war film now, whose side are you on? Who are you cheering on? I would say was rather on the side of the Allies than of the Germans. Without really? yes. What, you so really not, 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 you not consciously. Yeah. Yeah. You have being born at least twenty five years after the end of the war, you have built up such a distance to the Nazis that you don't really I, you cannot identify. Even though with it was your guys. uncle, your grandfather, your all your relations. You, you don't yes. see that they were... They are all exactly. Yeah. Do you think that as your generation comes along and the next one, that you will be able to start laughing about the war and... We are responsible now that the witnesses are dying, yeah. that this is not forgotten. Where you see the English people or British people, they are, have very much pride in themselves and the French people as well. But the Germans, they, they don't have something like that. They are very aware of their history and, their, and they feel very insecure with it. And that seems to be the Germans' biggest problem. We have to laugh at them because they're so riddled with guilt about their history, they can't laugh at themselves. Still, it could be worse, and indeed it will be next week when you join me in the sponge of Europe. Spain.